Good evening and welcome back to the church that meets here at Malden. So glad you took the time out of your day to come worship with, with us this evening. Just a few announcements before we get started with this evening's worship service. Uh, for those of you who weren't here this morning, I just want you to know that, um, that Charles and Ruth's um, estate sale will be uh, ending up tomorrow. I think the hours are from 10 to 5. So if you want to get over there and see if there's something you may want there. It'd be a good time to do it. I think after five, they're just wanting to load up trucks and get the stuff out of there. So if you have any interest in that, tomorrow from 10 to five on your Labor Day. Also wanted to remind everyone that the Augusta Road Church of Christ Gospel Meeting is gonna be on September 25th through the 28th. Uh, so try to make plans to be there, support them. Also wanna remember Ruth. Uh, as she's going to see her Greg's son, uh, those of you who know Greg, he, he's been ill for several years, and uh, his time is nearing the end, so she's going to go and, and spend some time with him, and, and hopefully she can get him calmed down. Uh, we'd like to thank Pam for, for the September bulletins. For those of you who weren't here this morning, uh, Susan Marshall did come in, so we just, we're just missing... Sue Dill now, I guess, and we'll be whole again, right? I haven't been here for a few weeks, so I don't think Sue's been here. I sure do miss Sue. Um, and then we also want to remember 9-11. Uh, we want to get our bulletins and remember the birthdays and anniversaries that we have in there. Feel free to give them a, a call and wish them a happy birthday or send them a card. And that's really all I have for tonight's uh, announcements. In this evening's worship service, uh, Brother Joel will be leading us in our song service, uh, and he will, uh, Brother Dad will have our closing prayer at the end of service, and also Brother Joel will be opening us up in prayer. Brother Joel. How are you? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this time that we have to assemble, to come out, to fellowship one with another, to approach your throne through this means of prayer, to sing songs of praises, for the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper, to commune with Christ, to remember his death, his resurrection on the cross. 
all that he did for us and to hear a lesson, study a lesson from your word. Pray that you'll be with us this evening in this service that we will each one take something with us that you will receive the glory of our worship. Pray that you'll be with those that well, John has mentioned that are still sick. That you bless them, be with them, be with the doctors and the nurses that wait upon them. We ask for a return of their health if it is your will. Father, we're thankful for the power that you have, that you can heal. If it is your will, we pray that you will do so, but we pray that you will lay your calming hand upon them. Sister Ruth as she travels this week, tomorrow, and others that are traveling during this holiday. Father, we're thankful for this church, the church the world over. We pray that we will stand for your truth, that we will try to be a light of Christ in the community, that we will reflect his glory so that others can see him in us. We pray, Father, that when we fail to reflect that light, when we do sin, we pray, Father, that you'll forgive us, that we are weak and sinful creatures. <coughs> we fail often, and we pray for, for your pray for your forgiveness and blessing. Father, we pray for our leaders, for our first responders, for our military. We pray that you'll protect them. For our leaders, we pray that you will hold them up, that they will do those things that are in accordance with your will, and we pray that you will defeat them in those things that are against your will. We pray that we, Father, as we see those that seem to be directing toward the idea that we should not obey you, but rather them, Pray that you will be with us, that we can stand up and realize, as Peter said in the book of Acts, we ought to obey, obey God rather than men. We pray that you will be with us in this service. Help Dennis to remember the things that he's prepared. Be with each of us that we will truly admonish, encourage one another in the songs that we sing. In all things, Father, your will be done. For we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Three, four, four. Three, four, four. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our lives, o'er the restless sea. Day by day his sweet voice soundeth, saying, Christian, follow me. Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden star from each idol that would keep us saying Christian love me more in our joys and in our sorrows days of toil and our
One, two, one. One, two, one. What are you doing, word or deed? Do all in the name of the Lord. Do not in name of man or creed. Do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in his name. Do all in the name of the Lord. In word or deed has God decreed. Do all in the name of the Lord. If you are toiling for a crown, do all in the name of the Lord. Oh, do not trust in world renown. Do all in the name of the Lord. Do all. comes speaks to us five seven nine five seven nine <clears throat> I have a song I love to sing inside and then reading of my redeemer Savior King since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name.
Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Starting in verse 18, and Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead. Looking at two men who thought they wanted to follow Jesus. This was right after Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And it had impressed an awful lot of people in what he had to say. But of these two men, one did not understand the deep commitment that was necessary. And Jesus put him off with materialism. The other man seemed to understand and seemed to truly wanted to follow Jesus, but he wanted to follow him on his own terms, and not the terms that Jesus had given in the command to follow him. Understanding these particular verses and what it really means is necessary for us to be able to see a little bit into each of these men. In the language that it was written in, it's necessary to have an understanding of that. In verses 21 and 22, in the original language, he's speaking in what they call the imperative mood. In, in other words, uh, it's usually used to express a command. And this man who wanted to follow Jesus in his wording, he used the word first. And it's not a measure of time, but it is an indefinite, which means there is no time element here. In fact, the father really wasn't dying. But this man wanted to wait around until such time as his father had passed away. So he commands Jesus to allow him to follow him on his terms. No crosses, no commitment, no dedication. I guess you could say it was more of an authoritarian type of request. But Jesus responds in the same manner. For Jesus said, follow me and leave the dead to bear their own dead. This evening we're going to look at two points. The first point of that is the command. In verse 22, Jesus said, follow me. He returned a command to a command. Jesus made this into a matter of authority which authority was to be followed. This was a command that Jesus had used numerous times in the Gospels. In Matthew 9, verse 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the booth of taxes. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. In John chapter 1, verse 43, says, then the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said, follow me. Matthew 4 and verse 19, he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. In John 21, verse 19, speaking to Peter, John writes this, he said to him, by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said, follow me. We don't oftentimes think of those words as a command, but that's exactly what they are. And we have been commanded to follow Jesus and his authority. We're reminded of this 
in the very end of Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, where Jesus said that all power was given to me in heaven and in earth. We sang a song a little while ago from Colossians 3 verse 17. Where Paul writes, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. Friends, there is no one in regards to spiritual matters. No person that we are to follow but him. There is no other authority. There's no other book that's been written other than the Bible. No manual that we are to follow, but only by God's prescribed word. The reason I bring this part up and, and do this lesson is that Christianity for centuries has been imitating the man in verse 21. We have for a very long time tried to dictate terms of salvation and in our following of Christ. We have been searching for shortcuts to heaven Shortcuts that will be a lot easier for us to do and won't require a lot of commitment. Many out there today treat Christianity as a part-time job at McDonald's. While you're working at McDonald's, you're wearing the uniform, you're saying the right things, you are forcing yourself sometimes to be courteous when all you want to do is punch the clock and leave. But once that time is over, you get out of the store, you take your uniform off, and you talk about the things that go on inside the store, and you don't have the loyalty. That is what some Christians are doing. They place all their security in a baptism as long as they do and say the right things while we're together, they're fine. They'll have that home in heaven. Sad truth is that most of us can be fooled by those things. But God cannot be fooled. And the shock will come when Christ returns. In verse 22, Jesus said, leave the dead to bury their own dead. And we need to have some insight in this phrase. And both Paul and John and Luke give us that insight on what is meant. Paul in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6, he wrote, but she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. In the Revelations 3 and verse 1, talking about the church, Sardis. Jesus said, and John writes it down, and to the angel of the church at Sardis, the words of him who is the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. And we find that in Luke in the prodigal son, Luke 15, verse 24, where this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be married. All of these are examples of living people who are dead. Not zombies, but people who have beating hearts, they're breathing. A death, in its true term, means a separation. When we die, we are separated from one another. James 2 and verse 26 reminds us that as for the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also.
Jesus said that there were some dead people who were to bury the dead. But who are they? I guess if we could say it as quickly and easily as possible, they're the other family members. But why did Jesus call them dead? His Jewish parents had done a good job of rearing their children. The father had cared for the family. I mean, they came and listened to Jesus preach. They liked what he heard, probably something they weren't getting in the synagogues. And if this was a good Jewish family, they never missed a meeting in the synagogue. But they were dead. And I guess what we could truly say about this is while we can be religious, we can also be spiritually dead. Especially if we use this as a social religion, a time to be together. Or it could be that these people accepted the rabbi's authority over God's authority. Maybe they thought if they were sincere enough that that would save them. But it is obvious in the words that Jesus used that they had not been sanctified by God. This is a tremendous lesson from the temporary nature of life itself. We will turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Those first 10 verses. And Paul writes here, For we know that at this tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing out for our heavenly dwelling, if indeed putting it on we may not be naked. For while we are still in this tent we groan, being burdened, not that we could be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by, the, by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. But we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body whether good or evil. It's safe to say that all of us, while we are alive on this earth, are groaning. Not only through the aches and pain, pains of growing, but also for the things that we face on a daily basis. And that is going to continue to happen until that day when we are separated from one another through death. There will be no comfort for our bodies at all. Our minds will be tormented. But what first is important to Jesus? In Acts 20, verse 28, Jesus talking to the elders at Ephesus, and he said, pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. We have something similar in Paul's discourse in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 25 through 26, talking uh, about husbands and wives. He said, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Those are the firsts. Christ, following him. That should be important to us, first and foremost. For a blessing comes when we do those things. 
Jesus in the Beatitudes, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Those are the firsts that matter. Nothing else. Maybe that's why it's so hard to be the Christian that we're supposed to be because of what must come first. And we battle with it within our own minds. Family, country, God. Things pulling at us from all different directions. It makes it difficult to make the choice that we're supposed to make and one that we desire to make. In 1 Corinthians 15, in the first four verses, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, that you all, which you also have received, and where you stand, by that which you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I have delivered to you, first of all, that which I had also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. We have that command in Matthew 8, verse 22. Follow me. But we also are to leave the dead to bury their own, to forsake everything else in following him. In light of these men, where do we stand today? You have not obeyed the gospel. Do you have your set of demands of God? Are you waiting maybe for God to change the requirements? Maybe you're waiting for a more convenient time. But we need to remember the prophet Malachi in Malachi 3 and verse 6, where God said, I am the Lord God, I change not. The requirements will never change. They will always be the same. So why do we wait for something to change? Felix was waiting for a more convenient season. He never got the chance. So why do we wait? The time to obey the gospel is today this very moment. And if you are a child of God, are you walking to your own tomb? And if that's the case, it's time to change the station. Unless you are obedient to God, you have strayed from that narrow path. Maybe it was not your intention to take the wrong fork in the road, but it happened. But there is a way to come back. God always leaves us a way. In both instances, repentance is necessary. We want to give you the opportunity to not get back on track to follow Jesus to make sure that your station in the future if you will is secure if there is any that has a need won't you come as together we stand and we say I have decided to follow
This time we'll be dismissed with prayer. Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to come out, hear a portion of our word, sing songs of praise unto thy name. We pray that you'll be with all of our number that we know of that are shut ins, are sick, the ones that's traveling, pray that you'll keep them safe and return them back to us. Pray that you'll be with each one of us here as we leave this place that you'll keep us, protect us throughout this week and we'll all be shining examples to others. That you'll be with us here, that you'll always guard, God, and direct us and forgive us all of any sin. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Austin, Austin, I'm sorry, you didn't know that. I'm sorry, 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 I